Well, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, welcome to the speaker series of the Snohomish County Transportation Coalition. I'm Brock Howell, Executive Director of SnowTrack. Today, SnowTrack, SnowTrack is excited to host Paul Comfort, an expert on leadership, transportation infrastructure, and transit trends. And uh, as a mobility management coalition, SnowTrack advocates for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County and beyond with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation by bringing together transportation and human service providers to identify mobility gaps and opportunities. SnowTrack focuses especially on the needs of people with disabilities, adult, uh, older adults, youth, low-income individuals, people of color, immigrants and refugees, veterans, tribal nations, uh, and rural communities. With our speaker series, we hope to inspire our leaders and advocates with best practices from around the country and world. And so I cannot be more pleased to have Paul Comfort join us here today. Paul is Senior Vice President and Chief Customer Officer for Mendoxo Americas, and hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Uh, he hosts the podcast Transit Unplugged, where he interviews top public transportation leaders about their lives, operations, and transit trends. And he's written four books on transit and leadership. A second while I, uh, including his most recent conversations on equity and inclusion in public transportation, which is a compendium of thoughts and actions by transit leaders. Paul started his public transit career in paratransit operations and eventually worked his way up to being the CEO of the Maryland Transit Administration, MTA, where he led a revolutionary change from a 50 year old and antiquated transit system to the world class Baltimore Link an efficient, high-frequency, connected rail and bus transit system in Baltimore, Maryland. Paul has also served as county administrator for two suburban counties in Maryland and was elected as a county commissioner. In the room today, we have many transit leaders, planners, and doers. Uh, Tom Hinkson, director of Everett Transit, is here. Staff from Washington Department of Transportation, Community Transit, Skagit Transit, Homage Senior Services, uh, Whatcom Transit or Transportation, Hope Link, King County, uh, Puget Sound Regional Council, and even Lane Transit District in Eugene, uh, Oregon, all represented here. Several people from consulting firms are here, including HDR, PRR, Tool Design, and uh, Come Engage. We have several staff and elected officials uh, from cities as well. Thank you all for joining us today. Please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat so we all know who is here and feel free to interact with one another there. Today, Paul will present his thoughts about the future of transit with a focus on equity and inclusion. At the end of his presentation, you'll have an opportunity to ask him questions. Paul, let's get this going. All righty, great, thanks Brock. And thank you for the invitation to speak to the group today. Great to see everyone. Um, I was just out in your neck of the woods, as they say, uh, for the APTA conference and have spent a lot of uh, a lot of time out in, in Washington State in that area. So great to see you all here today. As Brock said, um, I've got a 30 plus year career in public transportation and government. And um, through my podcast, I've been able to travel around the world uh, over the last six years. Uh, our podcast is uh, heard in 130 countries around the world. We interview public transit CEOs. I think I personally have visited more transit systems than anyone else alive today. Uh, no one, no one has been able to uh, to beat me yet when I've made that claim. I think I've visited 80, 90 transit systems just in the last six years uh, around the world. I just got back from Singapore, uh, where I spent a few days with Jeremy Yap at LTA and also in Malaysia. And uh, just before that, I was in Hawaii where we highlighted the new heart rail system, which will be the nation's first elevated autonomous rail system. So today, let me share my screen with you. Um, let me know if everybody can see it. It looks good to me. Does it look good to everybody else? It looks great. We're in the uh, PowerPoint version of it. Uh, All right, I'm trying to do the presentation mode. Is yep. that better? All right, good. Yep. All right. So the having the podcast and talking to public transportation executives almost on a daily basis around the world has given me kind of a good take on what's happening in our industry. And so Brock asked me to share that today. What are some of the top trends and then answer any questions? So I'm gonna take a look back at 2022 and a look forward to 2023 
And I want to tell you, I've been looking forward to this presentation. It's an honor for me to speak with you all. Uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. As you mentioned, here's about my background. Uh, you've heard almost all of that, uh, so I won't go over it again. Two things maybe he didn't mention is the four books I've written are down there at the bottom. Uh, the most recent one, Conversations on Equity and Inclusion in Public Transportation. We actually did the book launch uh, in Seattle at the um, APTA conference. It had a great event. This is a, a book of uh, over 20 leaders around uh, mostly North America talking about what they're doing right now to promote equity and inclusion in their community. I wanted to have something practical, practical steps. Uh, that book was number one on Amazon's list of mass transit books for six weeks. Uh, prior to that, I wrote a children's book during, that was my COVID lockdown project. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I've got grandkids and I couldn't find any books that would tell them what their grandfather did. And so I wrote one and I had it illustrated. It's been endorsed by UITP, the International Transit Union and is, um, you know, used in schools and things like that around the world. Uh, the book prior to that was like my breakthrough book, The Future of Public Transportation. Uh, it's still the bestseller I've, I've done so far. And it's uh, conversations with, it's 40 different public transportation leaders around the world. It's only three years old, um, but they all talk about the future of public transportation from Australia to Europe to here in America and North America, et cetera. And then my very first book was called Full Throttle. It was me and nine other public transit CEOs. Um, talking about what it took to get to the top, which largely involves going full throttle now and then. <laughs> so um, it was my most fun book to write. Uh, and uh, it's still, I'll be speaking this weekend at a writer's conference here in Maryland, talking about that book some. The other thing I do is I'm head of the Na uh, North American Transit Alliance, which is the group of contractors, the six largest public transportation contractors in North America. That's TransDev. First Transit, MV, Keolis National Express, RETP Dep. They formed an industry association during the pandemic to ensure that some of the COVID relief funds would flow down through the transit agencies to the contractors. Uh, they uh, hired me as their executive director, so I do that part time on the side. Medaxo America is my main company. You know, they own Trapeze, Vontis, TripSpark, uh, Route Match, Transloc, a bunch of software companies that are used primarily in public transportation. And uh, my job as CEO of the MTA made me uh, general manager of the Baltimore City Transit System, as well as uh, commuter rail system into Washington, D.C., uh, called Mark Train. I was building the nation's largest public-private partnership at the time, the Purple Line, a $5 billion, 16-mile light rail line around Washington, D.C. that connected into the metro state system there. We had 350 commuter motor coaches, which took people into Baltimore, Washington, Annapolis. And then, of course, the subway, the light rail system, the bus, and the paratransit in Baltimore City. Here's my take on where we're at right now. Prior to the pandemic, the number one KPI, key performance indicator for public transportation agencies in the US and Canada and Western Europe was ridership. Uh, I remember back in 2016, being at an APTA CEO conference in Florida and everybody's hair was on fire about the uh, decline of ridership over the last five years. And no one knew what to do about it uh, until 2016, that year. When Tom Lambert, the CEO of Houston Metro, rebooted his bus network uh, following input from uh, Jared Walker and some others, uh, basically took a look at the, uh, the ring around the city and how most of the routes were going into the downtown central business district and realized that's not where everybody wants to go today and rebooted the entire network overnight. And it worked. It worked slowly at first, but it worked. In 2017, seven city transit agencies in North America followed that. Um, one of them was Baltimore, mine. I went down and took 10 people from my staff and got a, uh, got, you know, spent a day learning from them in Houston what to do. And we rebooted our entire network, rebranded it, called Baltimore League. And uh, then in 2018, uh, more systems had an increase in ridership. And in 2019, the entire industry, saw an increase in ridership. We were really happy with that. We had gone past how Uber and Lyft and other folks had stripped away a lot of our, um, what they call choice riders and uh, fuel prices were a little more reasonable and people felt like, you know, transit was coming back in 2019. We were looking forward to 2020 until bam, the pandemic hit in March of that year. And suddenly, you know, ridership as everybody knows went off the, went off the rails. Uh, but the pandemic also created an inflection point for transit agencies to re-examine our reason to exist and to help society begin anew when we come out of that. And so that's what I want to start talking about today. 
uh, mobility recovery. Mobility equals recovery. We in the public transit industry are in a tremendous place. These are some of the uh, recent transit leaders that I had the opportunity to talk with at a Think Transit conference up on stage talking about how uh, coming out of the pandemic, we are recovering. Um, and our agencies help provide society recovery because we were in a lockdown for two years. What's the opposite of a lockdown? Mobility. That's what we provide. But coming out of it, transit agencies have new priorities. I'll show you proof of that in just a minute. But first, let me posit this. Our three real top priorities in public transportation or additional priorities that have been added to our list of top priorities. I've always felt like there were four North Stars for public transit agencies. When I was CEO of MTA, I even created a, um, a coin, a challenge coin that had it on it. I would give to people. And they were safety, efficiency, reliability, and world-class customer service. And everything we did was now going to be focused on those four. Now we've added some additional uh, points on our star. One of them is engagement. We are now more than ever focused on engaging with our customer base. And we'll talk about it in detail in just a few moments. Second is the environment. Public transportation has now um, transit agencies and the governing boards that oversee them and state legislatures like in California and here in Maryland have mandated that public transit agencies move toward zero emission vehicles as a way to help uh, improve the what I call environmental stewardship. Uh, and so cleaning the environment now is a core essential function of most transit agencies. And we measure our own success by how we're doing there. And then finally, equity, equity and inclusion, which is why I wrote my book. I feel like there's so many things, including microtransit, which you all are in the Seattle area are really one of the leaders in experimenting. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. Uh, but it is a, uh, basically creating opportunities for people that have not had them in the past. Public transportation is doing that now. APTA, the American Public Transportation Association, did a survey of its members in 2021, and they asked them, how do you measure your own performance now that we're in the pandemic and ridership had dropped dramatically? And we knew that, transit agencies knew that we could not measure our success primarily by ridership anymore because otherwise we were failures because ridership for a commuter bus and commuter train had dropped 90% plus. For most cities, their uh, public bus system, we told people, don't ride for over a year uh, unless you are a quote, an essential worker. Never sure I really liked that term, but understood what it meant. I think all work is essential and coming out of the pandemic now, evidently a lot of people don't feel like their work was essential. And that's why it's hard to get people to work. Uh, but uh, one of the reasons why maybe, but, um, but we delivered uh, during the pandemic. We kept society going. The wheels in the bus that go round and round to uh, paraphrase the children's song were also the wheels that made our economy continue to turn and allowed you know, the water main, water plant workers, the hospital and nurses and all their staff to get to work was on public transit. But public transit agencies realized that their number one goal now needed to be, if you build it, they will come. So they wanted to build uh, a system that would provide customer satisfaction, individualized customer satisfaction as well. People were tired of waiting at a bus stop without a shelter for 15 to 30 minutes for a bus that may or may not come on time or at all. So we needed to figure out a way to get them the information they needed, whether the bus was loaded, overloaded with people, all that all those uh, factors were involved in. And when the agencies responded to APTA, they said, for the first time in memory, ridership was not the number one KPI. I call it a false idol. I never felt like we should be worshiping a dead idol of ridership. I never felt like that was, that's the one thing we can't control is ridership. We can control all kinds of things, but we can't control it. We can influence it, but we can't control it. So why are we measuring our number one success? Largely because the funding sources, local politicians, of which I'm a recovering one, have said, why should I give you more money this year if you're serving less people? Well, maybe that's not the only measurement of success. The other third one is access to mobility options. That's how people were measuring success. Um, I'll wait to the end for questions. I feel like I should stop there and see if I have any questions. What do you think, Brock? Wait to the end? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. All right. Sure. So where are we at now? APTA just came out with this uh, a month or two ago. U.S. transit ridership is now at over 70% of pre-pandemic levels in, uh, in most cities. Some cities, Richmond, Virginia, and others, they're up to 90 to 100%. And on weekends, some commuter routes are serving more than they did uh, prior to now, which is great. Commuter services have had to readjust uh, who their market base is and move it away from the nine to five 
uh, commuters because uh, through hybrid work schedules, most cities now have moved to a three-day city where it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, where most people are coming to work and Mondays and Fridays, not so much. I just came back last week from Denver, where I was, or Aurora, Colorado, actually, where I was speaking at the Southwest Transit Association Conference. I spoke to a group of 60 CEOs and then spoke, at a, um, moderated and spoke at a panel talking about how to reboot your bus networks, how to start a system from scratch. And uh, there was lots of talk there about, basically, we should stop trying to compare ourselves to pre-pandemic ridership. Uh, it's a losing battle. And I would encourage us to consider that um, as we, as the nomenclature that we utilize, uh, comparing ourselves to pre-pandemic, we are a new service now with new priorities that we just talked about there. And so continuing to make that our number one comparison, how you doing pre-pandemic? I mean, I'm guilty of it myself. Uh, it's not a way to move forward. Um, I remember I was in London a couple months ago filming an episode of our Transit Unplugged TV show, and I was talking to Simon Reed, who is their head of innovation, who is the head of um, data for the agency outside of Twickenham Stadium where we were filming. And he said, I'm done with yesterday. Let's focus on what we're doing now and in tomorrow. We're, we are new, we are renewed. And I would agree with that. So here are the trends, the top global transit trends as I see them right now. The number one top transit trend is zero emission buses. Now, electric battery buses have been the number one priority that most transit agencies have focused on over the last couple of years. But that's changing. A couple of things have happened just very recently. One, Proterra Bus just laid off 150 of their bus employees last week, one of the major manufacturers, and they're supposedly going to do, have done, or are going to do more than that, I've been told. Um, I don't know if that's public news yet. I wouldn't share that anywhere, but uh, but lots of people that work for them have called me and told me uh, and gave me the number. So I didn't say that, but I wanted you to be aware of it if you weren't already. Uh, the other big trend is hydrogen fuel is coming on strong. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, at an upcoming conference where I'm helping to organize an executive summit, uh, it's called the Think Transit Conference, sponsored by uh, our companies at Medaxo in Nashville next month. I'm going to have several speakers come and talk just about hydrogen fuel. Um, the West Coast has been, you know, a big uh, proponent of that. Um, Lauren Skyver down in Southern California has the West Coast had the West Coast Center of Excellence. She just left, actually, become COO of Transdev. Um, but there's another one in the Midwest uh, that Stark Transit helps head and hydrogen because people are concerned about the stability of the electric grid based on all recent things that we all know are happening. Uh, people are looking at other zero emission fuels and hydrogen is coming on strong. I've had the chance to get on a hydrogen bus and uh, and understand you know how it works. And those who hear hydrogen sometimes think Hindenburg, but that was 100 years ago. It's a whole different world now. And uh, so a lot of transit agencies are piloting those now. Equity, as I mentioned, equity and inclusion is a top transit trend. Public transit agencies realized that not only could they help promote equity and inclusion inside their own agency, but if they did things differently with the services they provided, as I outlined in my book, I call conversations on that topic, we could actually make improvements in the cities that we worked in. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Julie Tim is one of my dearest friends in the industry. She was CEO of the Richmond GRTC. Now she's CEO of Sound Transit uh, out your way. Uh, but she wrote a chapter and we had a conversation, the book that she uh, led, and she talked about in Richmond, Virginia, just a simple thing. But I think it's emblematic of how transit agencies can promote equity and inclusion. She said, Paul, in Richmond, which was formerly the capital of the Confederacy, as you know, we have most of our bus shelters in the downtown business district for the white collar workers. But the people of color that lived out in the community or low income communities, they would have what I call a stick in the mud, right? A bus stop sign, no bench, no shelter, no trash can, nothing. She said, you know what we decided? We're going to change that. We're going to start adding uh, in our plans more equity, uh, more equitable distribution of those by putting them out where people actually have to stand and wait. Uh, and so we're putting shelters and benches and other amenities out in the communities now. So small, simple uh, way to do that. Other folks like um, down in New Orleans, Alex Wiggins, who now works for MV in California, just resigned as a head of Norda. Uh, he was called a transit evangelist. And he said, we're, everything we do, we're going to look through the lens of equity. So they started reshaping their routes and uh, even talking more about uh, frequency versus coverage, pushing more on the coverage side and some communities and more frequency on others. So equity has become a top trend in most transit agents. Of course, Terry White, my good friend there, who we led uh, until Michelle now, but Terry was uh, a 
also wrote the final chapter in my book. And we, uh, he talked about um, his efforts to use King County Metro to promote equity. The chapter I wrote was on microtransit. Microtransit, as you know, is on-demand public transportation. Uh, some of the things you all are doing in the Seattle area now are phenomenal in that area of combining them, I think, with, fixed, with uh, paratransit as well. But I believe microtransit, if you layer on top an on-demand transit service on top of your fixed routes, if you have to move your fixed routes because <laughs> maybe the ridership on a certain route doesn't justify a 40 or 60 foot bus anymore, but you don't wanna leave anybody stranded. You don't wanna disenfranchise anyone. So microtransit in those regions can help make sure that, that those few individuals who now don't have a fixed route on their street anymore can still get coverage right up to the curb. Another big trend is connected journeys. Um, as an example, when I arrived in Baltimore, the public transit system there in 2015-16 was disjointed, disconnected, unmoored. Uh, the, the different various of our six modes were laid in over a period of years. The bus routes were laid out 50 years ago, and two-thirds of them served the downtown central business district where there was 145,000 jobs. But there were 230,000 jobs in the metro area around and around the Beltway. The light rail system had been laid out 25 years ago when our governor, William Donald Schaefer, wanted to make sure that we had light rail service to the Baltimore Orioles Camden Yard Stadium by the time they opened up, and they opened up on the day that the stadium opened. The subway system was opened up um, five years before that, and the commuter train service was opened up a few years later, and none of them connected in any meaningful way. And so part of the reason why we called it Baltimore Link was that we were now going to change the bus routes to create 12 color-coded high-frequency routes, which pulse in and out of the downtown at 15-minute intervals. And they would be connecting in with all the rail modes. We had three rail modes that ran as separate entities. We literally, and most, I gotta tell you, you I'm sure most of you who have been in the transit business for a while already understand this, but in many transit agencies, they are not integrated networks. The rail system, the subway system has their own upline, their management, their own maintenance yards, their own road supervisors, their own dispatchers, their own operations control center, light rail the same way, bus the same way, all these stovepipe institutions in a transit agency, and they never the twain shall meet till they get to the very top, and they might report to the chief operating officer, and sometimes not even that. Sometimes they don't report till they get to the CEO. It's a terrible way to run a transit system, in my opinion. And I've spent, I've spoken on it probably 50 times around the world at various conferences and to transit agencies, working with cities like Sydney, Australia, with their work to, to connect and integrate their networks better. The bus networks obviously are the way to do that because you can't move the rail necessarily. So changing your bus routes to integrate and to make sure there's connection protection so that if a bus is coming, the rail line will wait for it so you don't have people left there stranded at the rail station. Rebooting the bus networks and integrating networks, connecting them all, uh, allows people to have so many more options. It is, it can be troublesome. Changing bus routes can cause a lot of people a lot of heartburn. My, uh, the deputy uh, secretary at the Maryland Department of Transportation who became the secretary recently, uh, before we had a recent governor's election, said that in his opinion, rebooting bus networks was second in pain only to rebooting, I'm sorry, to uh, redistricting an elementary school. <laughs> and uh, I think he might be right there when it comes to government actions. Other big trends that are happening is what I talked about, the customer experiences, right? These are some examples of it. Um, I recently was in uh, Malaysia, as I mentioned, and it's funny because I had interviewed uh, the woman who was CEO of a Malaysian rail line, which took you from downtown Kuala Lumpur out to the airport, which I rode going back. And they have a system where on your phone, you can order a coffee the way you want it, two creams, sugar, et cetera. When you get to the airport, not only will they have taken your bags for you, you don't have to touch your bags, your suitcases once you put them on the train, but they'll hand you the coffee the way you want it as you walk off the rail. Amazing. Uh, other places like in um, Metrolinx, uh, that runs Go Bus and Go Train in Toronto, Canada. My good friend Phil Verser, the CEO there, has a deal with Loblaws Grocery Store where commuters can, when they go to work in the day, they can order their groceries online. When they get back to the train station, they get a code emailed to them. There's a refrigerated locker. Their groceries have been put in that locker for them by the grocery store. Uh, they've already paid online by their credit card or their debit card, and they're able to take their groceries out, put them in their car, and go home without having to stop by the grocery store. Those type of amenities, obviously Wi-Fi, you know, um, plugins for uh, 
charging on your on your buses and trains. Those are obvious customer experience uh, improvements. But these are what people are doing now to improve uh, the overall customer journey. And then finally, upgrading technology. Everybody is aware now that you know customer apps, uh, fairing has changed. A lot of systems are moving away from cash. I remember being in London back in 2016 and Shashi Verma, the chief tech technology officer of TFL showed me that they had just gone to tap and go credit cards where you take your just regular MasterCard or Visa and you get close to uh, the, the reader and it takes the fare off there. And you, know, you don't have to have any separate fare card or separate cash or any other medium. Uh, and so he said in six months, there was a 40% uptake in usage of that technology. Those are the kind of new technologies that systems are adopting. Unfortunately, a lot of systems are still stuck in the 1990s when it comes to the technology. I can tell you that I was in the bus yard in the dispatch office of a major transit system a couple of years ago. Um, it was in Canada, actually. And uh, I was very surprised to see up on the wall a map of the bus yard. And somebody, a utility worker, had walked the yard and written the number of the bus, bus number 22, bus number 19, bus number 33, up on this chart so the dispatch would know where the buses were when they sent the drivers out. And obviously that changes on a regular basis. And, you know, there's, there's such easy, obvious technology now to track your buses in your own yard to show exactly where they are right now. And, you know, it, if you know where your buses are, obviously it will help your system be more efficient, right? Your, uh, your drivers will know exactly where to walk to get the bus or the utility worker, if they're gonna pull the bus up, which is what I recommend, pull the buses up to the front so you don't have drivers congregating out in the yard or spending 15 minutes looking for their bus before they do the pre-trip. Just have your utility worker start the bus and pull it up to the front and assign it as they go out the door and have them log into their mobile data terminal and then you know what bus they're in. That's what we did in Washington, D.C. eight, nine years ago when I, I ran the paratransit system for WMATA for five years as a contractor through MV. And that's something we did then. And it's simple technology upgrades are great ways that transit agencies are adapting for now. Now let's flip on the other side. That's what the transit agencies are doing. What are the customers telling us? And I'd be interested when we get into the Q&A if you're hearing this as well from your customers. Here's what, as I have gathered, survey data, information from public transit agencies and anecdotal information as I talk to transit executives on a weekly basis. Here's what I've been hearing. This is what the customers need now. If we wanna make that our number one KPR, one of our top KPIs, we have to deliver reliable and consistent service. What does reliability normally mean? On-time performance. Your on-time performance of a bus system in a major city in the US prior to the pandemic was about 78% on-time performance. And that was even giving a window like we do in paratransit of five or 10 minutes on either side of the time when the bus was supposed to be there. As you know, most buses are run through time point management, but as we've gone to frequency as freedom, as Kevin Quinn likes to say, my successor at the MTA who now runs TransLink uh, in Vancouver, um, we now have gone away from time point management and gone to headway management where a bus is coming every 10 to 15 minutes, that high frequency where you don't need a schedule. So it's reliable and it's consistent. Remember when I got to the MTA in Baltimore, on Mondays after a football game, a lot of drivers called off. And we couldn't meet our runs. And we would have 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 cut runs out of, um, you know, out of a couple hundred runs we had during the day. So you had to figure out ways to be consistent. And there's lots of ways you can do that. The other one is environmental considerations. People are concerned about the environment. I really like in Hawaii, uh, on the Oahu Transit Service now, where they've gone to electric buses. They have, and it's actually on my podcast next week, I interview um, the deputy CEO, John Nucci. I was texting him last night around 11 p.m. They're six hours behind us here. But they have put the Hawaiian word for electricity or lightning on their electric buses. Very cool. That connects with people. So the environmental concerns, people, I love the fact that public transit is, it's always been clean, right? It's always, even when we use diesel, clean diesel buses, uh, every bus took, you know, dozens, scores of, of cars off the road. But now using zero emission or low emission fuels, CNG, electric or um, uh, hydrogen, like I mentioned, it, people really, they feel connected to public transit in a way that it's aligned with their core inner principles. It also needs to be convenient and fit into their lifestyle. They need to be aware of all the options, not just where the bus goes, but they want to be able to know what the rail system is or is there micro transit? Can I ride a bike or a scooter? Is Uber connected in with your system? They want to be able to trust the network end to end. Is it 
if I ride the bus and transfer to a to a rail system, am I going to be picked up or am I going to be left behind like too often we are in airports? They want to know end to end, can I use the entire network? They want access to polite assistance. That seemed to have gone away during the pandemic. Uh, and it also means telephone assistance. I can't tell you how aggravated I'm sure we all get now when almost everywhere we call because people can't get staff. Uh, the phone call is picked up by a machine who then get, runs you through a series of options. The last one, number eight, is always the one to talk to a person. And then when you push eight, it says, tell me what you're calling about and I'll be able to connect you to somebody who can even help you more. How irritating is that? Uh, polite, prompt assistance is what people want. A live voice, if you can do it pretty quickly on the call. A multimodal journey availability and safe, accessible, seamless, easy, and quick a lot of easy words to say, very difficult to deliver, but that's what customers want. Here's what's happening when it comes to paratransit. I told Brock I wanted to share some on this because so much is happening now in this world. So pretty wild. I've spent a lot of my career in paratransit and feel a special connection with people with disabilities. And, and I feel like they need us more than almost anyone. And so we have to really deliver top quality service to them to make their lives better. Paratransit and microtransit now, though, are in many cities converging. These personalized on-demand service, like what's happening in King County Metro with Metroflex just announced today, actually, officially on the news media. I just shared it on my LinkedIn profile just before I did this call. I read the article about it. Um, Ride KC Freedom was the model. Robbie Mackinnon, uh, the only blind CEO of a major transit system in North America, one of my dearest friends in the industry who's currently without a job. Um, was pushed out at, at uh, KCATA, but he started it. He said he was when he was, you know, he became blind as an adult. And he said, I tried to ride the paratransit system and it sucked. I couldn't get around. It wasn't connected. The Johnson County next door and all the places I couldn't connect, they would drop me off somewhere. I'd wait an hour, an hour and a half for another van to pick me up from another jurisdiction. It's crazy, man. And uh, so he started Ride KC Freedom, a real on demand paratransit system. He eventually made it free. Uh, for people with disabilities, for students, for veterans. And then eventually they made their entire system free of charge. Still costs, somebody has to pay for it. That's why they don't call it free transit. They call it zero fare. But uh, they became a model for a lot of transit systems that went and visited them. And uh, other cities are looking at doing this now as well. Uh, basically, you're running your paratransit system, which is required by the Americans with Disabilities Act to as a civil right to provide people with disabilities on demand public transportation, curb to curb, although many do door to door, as we did in Washington, D.C. And um, it is uh, commensurate paratransit. So the fare can only be twice as much as fixed route. And uh, if you can't ride the fixed route, if you are, have a certified, if you're certified with a particular disability, as outlined under the regulations, you can get this service. Microtransit is something that really started off before the pandemic, took off during the pandemic as the extra federal funds came into cities. And people like Las Vegas and other people said, I'm going to use some of this money to pilot some new programs that we've always wanted to do. So now they're out there. The funding is drying off, as they've said in San Francisco. You know, it's a fiscal cliff that's coming when they run out of the federal funds. So now they're talking about it uses the same technology, this um, reservation scheduling dispatch technology. Let's merge those into one service. Other models, which I think we haven't looked at enough in the industry, but I want to highlight them for you today as very interesting personally to me, and I think they work. WMATA, my friend Christian Blake, who runs the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, uh, their paratransit service, which serves all of Washington, D.C., and parts of suburban Maryland and parts of suburban Virginia, they've started uh, a lottery where they allow 20% of their daily people who have, who have opted in in a rider's choice program to then be picked up by a taxi cab or a TNC. And they have 10 of these uh, transport networking companies like Uber and Lyft, User, other companies, Silver Ride, uh, that will pick people. I don't know if there are these particular ones, but they're being used across the country. And they'll assign that trip. And people love being picked up in a car versus what I call a rattle trap, raised groove van. Um, and so, and it's cheaper. It's a lot cheaper. And so he's doing that on a daily basis. Then I was in Dubai last year and spoke at a conference there, a UITP Middle East North Africa conference, and um, spent a lot of time talking with the transit leaders there uh, in Dubai and did a television show about it on our Transit Unplugged YouTube network. And uh, I was very surprised to find out that their 11,500 taxi cabs are integrated right into their overall public transit network. Half of them are actually owned by the, by the government, by the transit agency. And um, <coughs> uh, Ahmad 
Barosian is the CEO. And he told me that in their operations control center up on the screen, they can see all the taxi cabs. They're all logged in and uh, they're logged in through their mobile data terminals and they can deploy them as needed as micro transit or to when there's a big event, they can send them there. So pretty interesting. A uh, company I used to work for was Yellow Transportation in Baltimore like 20 years ago. And I managed 10 of their public transportation services, but they also had Yellow Cab in Baltimore. And we never integrated the cab service in with bus service or micro transit. We just never did. It was a separate thing. And now cities are saying, you know what? Why not include cabs as part of our overall solution to mobility? And then finally, the big uh, thing happening is mobility as a service apps are happening. Dallas and Dart is one of my favorites where they, you know, on your phone, on your smartphone app, which is overseen by the transit authority, uh, Gary, the former CEO there, uh, and David Leininger, the CFO, oversaw that. I went down and met them while they were coming up with version two or three uh, and talked to them about what they're doing. But basically, all the mobility services in a city are on one app. It was started by WIM in Finland uh, as, a, as an option, maybe in the last decade. But it's, uh, it's really taken hold now. It kind of went down during the pandemic, but now it's coming back up as a trend. But basically, the idea is on your phone, you can book plan and pay for, I should do it the other way, plan for it, then book it, then pay for it, all on your phone. And all the transactions are done behind the scenes. You have an account. And so if you want to have an Uber pick you up, take you to the train station, the train takes you downtown, you get off there and ride a bike to the last three blocks of your office. All of that's done with a scan of your phone. And uh, <clears throat> it's very interesting and exciting. It's not really highly utilized in a lot of cities that have it, but it is picking up. Other trends in paratransit, include micro transit pilots addressing transit deserts. I mentioned Las Vegas, my friend MJ Maynard, who's the CEO there, told me that Paul, during the pandemic, I wanna use these federal funds to try to put out some micro transit service into areas where we haven't had any type of mobility, public mobility in the past, what they call transit deserts, and see if we're pick up some ridership. And then we'll know how much demand there is if we wanna run a bus out there or keep it as a, a micro transit. And then, as I mentioned, integrated mobility networks. So, Microtransit is now being used to help feed people into transit hubs. Places like Tampa, Florida have done that for years where they would use Uber and Lyft and you get a discount if you ride Uber to a transit hub. Then there's a new reimbursement model being done by my former executive assistant when I was CEO of the transit agency. He now is head of paratransit in Baltimore and his name is Josh and he is starting a new reimbursement model. As you know, everyone is desperate for drivers, hungry for staff. to. He changed the model where he's reimbursing his contractors, MV, First Transit, Transit, those guys. Uh, instead, of re instead of reimbursing them by the revenue hour or by the mile, he now is reimbursing them by the body, by the full-time driver that they can deliver for his service. Well, guess what? Money talks. Follow the money. So these companies then put all their resources into Baltimore and brought in outside recruiters, staffed up to 100% so they could get full reimbursement. And now the on-time performance of Josh's large paratransit system, which is running 6,000 trips a day, one of the largest in the country, is 96% um, is on time because he has enough staff, just because he changed the model. Now, it is affecting productivity. Productivity is what we call passengers per hour. And I would say productivity and on-time performance in paratransit are like two sides uh, pulling a uh, tug-of-war on a rope. If you put too many people in the vehicle, uh, on-time performance suffers, but your productivity will be higher. You might have two trips per hour, three trips per hour, but if you pull too much on on-time performance, you, you can't do it with as many people in the vehicle. So by reimbursing by the body, there's enough drivers uh, and there's on-time performance, but there may not, but the productivity passengers per hour, which is the efficiency rating, uh, which indicates cost uh, is higher, but there's less complaints. So it depends on what your priority is. It's interesting. I'm going to have him come speak at Think Transit about that. And, and I told him he's going to have to stand up to questions from the audience. Bringing in more drivers, equity and inclusion. And then the last one, autonomous vehicles. That's me standing at one of the autonomous vehicles that Nat Ford runs in his test and learn facility in Jacksonville, Florida, where he's taken various models of autonomous vehicles, these like 10, 11 passenger uh, vehicles that don't need a driver. They're currently running at stage three or four and run them through tests, you know, with, with uh, rain and stopping. And we did a whole fun thing on the TV show about it where I walk in front of it when they're not ready for me to see if it'll stop. And they're providing feedback to the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, on how that these vehicles can be more, um, uh, more valid for transit use. 
as a small vehicle. So that a lot of transit agencies are piloting those. Getting close to the end here, Brock. Uh, so the uh, this is a, a slide I came up with a few months ago, which I think I'll let you just take a minute and look at it if you'd like to. This is what I see a really smart city with integrated transit having, where there's driver advice for even the drivers in the train to how them do energy savings, how to run, how to uh, you know how, how to um, speed up and slow down. There's efficient fleet and resource management. There's enhanced passenger information, meaning not only on your phone, but also at the bus shelters. There's an electronic sign, which will say when the next bus is coming. So people can know that. Transit signal priority, TSP. I added 35 intersections in Baltimore. We got money for it as a way to make sure the buses could get through quicker. It holds the light green longer for buses and makes the red light turn green faster for buses so that there's a you get an advantage if you ride on bus. Uh, the headway management, we've already talked about that. The integrated ticketing, where if you have multiple transit providers in one city, that you should work toward the opportunity to have people use one mode of payment so they don't have to have multiple cards and tickets and things like that in their pocket. Mobility as a service journeys, as we've already talked about, by uh, planning, booking, and paying for all of that on one app. Uh, dynamic scheduling, meaning that uh, if a one route is running late when it comes to microtransit or paratransit, that trip can be moved dynamically to another route that has room. This is, I spent tons of time doing this personally uh, when I managed the call center for the last two years at WMATA, Washington Metro. We used to say that stood for we meet and talk a lot because we had so many meetings. But um, basically, you know, moving trips all day that are running late is not a great way to stay on time. You need lots of staff. There's programs now, software programs that'll do that automatically, dynamic scheduling. And then the connection protection that I talked about, that's always key, right? And then of course you want integrated taxi cabs or microtransit for first and last mile connections and maintenance of clean fleets. These are all ways to improve uh, uh, an integrated overall public transit network in a region like Snohomish County. Um, I think that's basically the main gist of it. Just wanted to share with you my free resources, if you're available, if you're interested in them. Uh, I have a weekly podcast called Transit Unplugged. As I mentioned already, it's a half hour show. It comes out on Wednesdays. It's on all podcast platforms. Or you can go to ours, transitunplugged.com. Uh, it's heard now in over 100 countries. You won the app to ad wheel a few years ago. I wanted to do this TV show, which is basically a video podcast, right? Uh, but the pandemic stopped it. So once the pandemic was over, basically, we started this last year. We have now 13 episodes, one a month, where I visit a different city and um, film their CEOs and their transit system. We talk about it. and But I also do like an Anthony Bourdain style, which is really what my, my uh, he's my muse on this. I wanted to do the culture and the food as well as the transit and create the whole environment, how public transit helps people get around, how it fits into the culture of a city. The one we did in Denver and Hawaii most recently are two of the best examples of that. And it's, uh, it's on YouTube, as I mentioned, uh, on Transit Unplugged TV. If you're interested, they're about mm, 20 minute shows. Uh, and then my most recent book that I already mentioned, uh, I've seen if somebody you might know wrote on the back. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but it was a lot of good conversations in there if you're interested. Um, and uh, I, uh, I'm i happy to send Brock a free, if I already haven't sent you one, Brock a free e-copy and you can send everybody on the group a free e-copy, a PDF of the book if you're interested in getting it. Uh, I just want to get the message out there. That's the main thing. And that's it. I'll stop sharing. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to share. And I'm happy to answer questions or talk further, or you can dispute what I said and love to get in a little debate if you want to. I'm game. Well, that, that was fantastic. Um, I'm going to lead off with two questions, a kind of big picture, uh, just get your thoughts, and then I'll uh, open up to, to questions. So folks, feel free to type your question in the chat if you don't want to come on video and say it out loud, um, or raise your hand uh, using the raise your hand feature. So first question, um, you know, I, I'm not sure we get to the place where you're writing a book around equity and inclusion uh, without the death of George Floyd in 2020. It was a major change and um, it was highlighted by David Kim in your interview with him in the book, uh, former secretary of transportation uh, in California. Um, kind of just expound your thoughts on the transition that's happened over the last three years and the importance of that conversation we've had. Sure. Yeah, well, um, to me, you know, I almost see this push of equity inclusion. Not everyone agrees with me, but this is my personal opinion. Uh, I've spent a lot of my career trying to use public transportation to help people with disabilities, people that needed an extra hand, 
they want it to get out there. They don't want to sit at home. They don't want to, uh, you know, they want to be productive. And so paratransit, I, I actually started in 1987 uh, running for working for a Department of Aging, running the elderly and disability transportation and started the county's public bus system in 91. We won the award from CTAA as the best small bus system in America. But I always felt like transit should be there to help people who need it most. And this is kind of just an extension of that almost. People who have been marginalized or disenfranchised for various reasons, as you mentioned, the George, the George Floyd situation brought a lot of it to light, but also lower income folks um, and uh, the elderly, uh, people of color that have been marginalized, public transportation is their lifeline. And so we need to make sure that it's not just geared toward taking the white collar workers to the tall buildings in the downtown, which unfortunately I feel like has been our primary focus for the last 10 years or so. Um, and uh, we put all of our resources into that or a lot of them. And as a result, other things suffered. Well, so COVID in some ways, the silver lining of COVID was that it took away that push toward ridership because it wasn't going to happen. And it let people sit back and reflect, which is how I started my presentation. The COVID pandemic was a period of reflection. A lot of us did it personally, we reflected our lives and said, you know, is this really what I want to be doing for the rest of my life, you know, my career? In my case, it was, yes, I want to double down on it uh, because I think mobility is a way to really, one of the, you know, one of the best ways to improve people's lives. Um, and so uh, I think that during that time of the pandemic, transit agencies, the governing boards, and the, the executives all thought, you know what, we could be doing more in this area. We've wanted to do it, but we've been so focused on this one, you know, golden calf, this idol that we've been worshiping. Now that we don't have to worship that anymore, and the politicians get it, now we can focus where we should have been focusing, which is helping people that really need it. So is that, is that uh, a good start off with the conversation? And I guess building off of that, my next question is, you know, looking through many of the uh, the folks who wrote in the book and what they said, um, you know, there's a lot about how uh, transportation isn't just about physical mobility, it's about socioeconomic mobility. So Julie Tim said something close to mobility is not just about physical movement, but also socioeconomic movement, which is when we think about prosperity and transportation, physical movement all tied together. And Terry White um, had maybe a little bit different take, a little bit more place-based, but uh, said place is never just a physical address, place is socioeconomic, place is one's position within society, place is a specific condition, place is a state of mind, and connecting it of how transit is connecting uh, that element. And many others uh, also talked about um, how transit agencies need to shift from just being a transit agency to being a mobility agency. And That's right. Mobility being not just uh, the transportation, but the socioeconomic mobility. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on those conversations you've had with. Yeah, I told Terry when he wrote that, I said, Terry, that's like poetry, man. <laughs> I feel like you're writing poetry. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, so I, I agree with all those statements. And uh, I agree with most of what was written in the book, actually, not everything, but you know, probably 80 to 90 percent of it. Everybody has their own opinions on things. Um, I think another you know, conversation that has been started is faring. And uh, do we want to go to zero fare? Is that something that cities should invest in as a way to promote equity, right? Some people can't afford uh, a regular bus ride. They can't afford that monthly $60 pass per se is what we charge in Baltimore. So you've got people like um, Noah Berger uh, outside of Boston in a transit system who wrote a chapter in the book and who I'm going to have come down and do a debate at our Think Transit conference. He's going to promote the zero fare side. And I've got the head of the Southwest Transit Association who's a trained debater presenting the side of transit agencies like San Francisco and other big cities who say, look, it's a great idea, but we can't afford it. You know, if we're gonna invest in transit, we, we need the fares. Um, so I think that's another great kind of um, line of thought that we're going down now and promoting equity. So here's the, here's the example, really interesting. So, you know, Randy Clark who's one of our top transit CEOs in the country came from, uh, came from Austin, Texas and took Paul Wiedefeld's place at WMATA Paul Wiedefeld, by the way, has just been named Secretary of Transportation for my state, Maryland, which I'm really happy about. He's a good friend. He ran the airport, BWI, when I ran MTA, and we were, we were work pals. Um, but uh, <clears throat> Randy came up and said, you know what? We lost $42 million, I think that was the number, in fare evasion last year. We're coming up to $120 to $140 million deficit in our budget. We're going to have to start enforcing fares. So he, uh, you know, 
he didn't say this, but other people have kind of, you know, said the summer free love is over, you know, we're going to start enforcing pairs. And so, um, again, he did not say that. That's just a quote I heard somebody say somewhere. But uh, so they're talking about, you know, better, uh, more police officers, more uh, folks enforcing fares, and also even at the stations, you know, at the subway stations, metro stations, having some kind of blockage, people can't kind of jump the fare gate. Um, and uh, so all these things were happening So because he needs the money. Well, Mata, unfortunately, doesn't have a dedicated fair source. They have to go hat in hand every year to their to the federal government, to Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, and ask them as part of their budget to give money to them. While he's doing that, while he's doing that, the city of Washington, D.C., was one of his funding agencies, the city government, the council says, we're going we're gonna to take money from our budget, $42 million, and transfer it to your budget, Randy, so that anybody who rides the bus service, not the rail, but the bus just in D.C., not in the Maryland and in Virginia suburbs, it'll be free starting in, starting in July. The mayor doesn't like that evidently and said, you know, she wasn't going to support that. Well, it passed 13 to nothing. So it passed without her signature. So while he's trying to enforce fares, the city council is saying zero fare. So it's an amazing time of, uh, you know, uh, differing opinions on how we can approach this. All right, uh, Tom Hinkson, Director of Rapid Transit, has his hand up and video, so I'm gonna go to him next. Hey, Tom, how you doing, buddy? Yeah, nice to see you, for real. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> nice to see you, thank you for joining us today. You said a couple of things that were um, intriguing to me, going back earlier in your presentation, talking about having um, the non-bus driver bring the bus up to the, the driver, which sounds really efficient, but I'm wondering it, how you got around or or justified the fact that the driver driving wasn't responsible for their own pre-trip. We made them do the pre-trip. It was paratransit we did it at. Uh, fixed route, we lined them up better for them, but we still made the driver come out and do their own pre-trip. Lost you. I lost yes. the volume. Oh, you lost me? Yeah, um, but I think, I think what you're saying is that you brought it up to them, then they did their pre-trip. That's right. And they moved on. That's right. Got yeah. it. Okay. When we had a, we had a garage in Capitol Heights, Maryland, and we had 450 vans there, Tom. It was the it was our biggest paratransit garage. And so, you know, the drivers are starting, as you know, when it's dark outside. Yeah. Um, so even if you put some lights out in the parking lot, they're still not able to really see where they're going. There's 450 vehicles there, man. And so uh, I didn't come up with it. My safety guy came up with it. He said, what if we just bring them up in a line and we don't assign them ahead of time on their manifest? Uh, where they have to go out and find bus 32. Uh, but we bring it up and when they get out to the vehicle, it's, you know, we have a line of them, like 10 vehicles and they come out and they do their, it's in the light because it's in front of the place. We have lots of light in front of the main garage or in front of the main dispatch area. And they could do the pre-trip, get in, plug in, you know, on the mobile data terminal, what vehicle they're in. And we know it pops up on our computer screen and then they could, man, the drivers loved it. Everybody yeah. loved it. And we loved it as a contractor just being frank with you, because now we didn't have to pay 15 minutes for pre-trip. And sometimes we had to pay 20 minutes for them to find it. Now we're able to do it in 12 minutes. I negotiated with the union, a 12 minute pre-trip period. Um, and uh, so it was more efficient. The drivers didn't feel like they were out in the dark trying to find their vehicle and trip and fall or anything crazy like that. So it was, it was used for us in paratransit. And we did it for years, very successfully. So the, the other thing you mentioned is integrating um, non-transit services like taxis or Uber, Lyft or whatever as part of that on-demand system. But once it becomes sort of our um, under our umbrella as a federally you know, funded operator, right? how do we deal with things like the drug and alcohol testing and all those requirements and how, do, how some of these people work through those kinds of things? Because you don't really know who you're dealing with. Yes, that is an excellent question, Tom. Thank you. Uh, so there's two two things happening, just like I was talking about the fairing thing, you know. So I actually spent uh, uh, quite a bit of time this last week in Denver talking to the Uber people about what they're doing. Uh, and I'm real familiar with what companies like Userve, I don't know if you've heard of them before, but they are spanning the country. <clears throat> I just did a call with their CEO and head of business development yesterday. So there are two companies that I'm aware of, Userve and uh, Silverride, that are doing very similar. They're adaptive TNCs, and they are having drivers use their own vehicles, just like Uber and Lyft, but they are drug testing them, 
alcohol testing them and training them how to handle people with disabilities. Uh, and so it's a much more controlled environment. These drivers fit the ADA requirements because they meet all the obligations. And so PACE, for instance, PACE just gave them a contract in Chicago, a big one there. Other cities across the country are doing that. Other cities have opted for what they call rider's choice. And the FTA supposedly is letting this happen. So uh, Dmitry Vanjigov, who used to work with me at Trapeze, and now he's one of the top guys at Uber, Paratri Uber Transit, they call it. What they're doing now, and they spoke about it at this conference, is um, if you are a paratransit um, passenger, if you opt in, you have to opt in to a rider's choice program, you may get an Uber or a taxi cab where the driver is not drug tested. They will be background checked because most taxi cab agencies, the Public Service Commission requires that, and Uber does do, as I understand it, and Lyft does too, their background check. So you may get a driver's background check, but isn't trained and doesn't have a drug test, which is a lot of concern people have, but we'll send that person to pick you up. And so when it's outside of the ADA rubric, like that's what's happening in Washington, DC, where he's taken 20% of his trips, people who have said, click, I'm clicking, I'm gonna go, or I've said on the phone, yes, I'm gonna be part of this Rider's Choice program, which means I understand that I'm gonna get a driver that may not be drug tested or trained, but they'll pick me up and I'll have access to really more convenient transportation. The big the big move is, you know, not to have to do a 24 hour uh, to seven days in advance notice that ADA requires, but I can, I can book a trip right now and have a taxi cab, just like a person that, you know, without a disability. And so that's what's happening on both sides of that spectrum. That was fantastic. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. So we're going to, I think, probably just do one or two more questions here um, before we wrap up. Rebecca has had her hand up for a while, and then maybe we'll pick one up from the chat. So. Uh, Rebecca, if you'd like to ask your question. So I think I have myself unmuted. Is that correct? You do. You're good. Okay. So, hey, Paul, haven't talked to you for a long time. Yeah. Hey, Rebecca. Um, so anyway, um, this is related to a number of, of thoughts. So we have, you might be aware, legislation at the state level that actually I believe just passed out of the Senate floor um, to basically override local zoning laws and basically saying that you know, if you're near a transit center, and, and which is somewhat undefined, um, you we're going to just basically say you can put all kinds of development there, you know, multifamily. And I don't want to get into politics of this. But given what you said today in terms of, um, you know, kind of, so what they're doing is, you know, we've got, a, you know, Sound Transit has light rail systems, you know, we could have Sounder down here in Edmonds. But, you know, we're going to put lots of development there. But, you know, so people might be able to take one trip. And then they're saying, since they can use public transportation because they can take this one trip, we're not even gonna provide parking for their cars. Um, and so then these people need to take all their other trips, but now they, they have their cars, I don't know, you know, stacked in, in the clouds. Yeah, where are the cars it. at? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so how does this work? And, and, and what do we say actually to the state legislature and say, you know, have you thought this through? Right. Well, I think maybe what they're saying is people can take a ride through microtransit, Uber, Lyft, or taxi cab, and not have to have a place to park. A lot of cities are moving toward reducing parking in their downtown areas as a way to force people uh, to use, force is probably too strong, but encourage them strongly to utilize uh, public mobility. And so maybe that's what's happening there. I, I'm, I'm well, not so sure. Now, I'm not this is actually, this is everywhere, not just downtown. Okay, yeah. So it could um, be, I mean, obviously it's somewhat centered around where stuff is. But right. it, it, it's way broader. And so once you take your one trip, everything else you need to do, um, well, you need to have a car. The, or a um, microtransit works, yes, but we don't have a, while we have a microtransit system, it's nowhere near up to the level that yeah, needs to, to be. To handle all that demand, yeah. Right. Maybe we'll finish on this question, Paul, that kind of maybe reorients Rebecca's question. What are uh, trans agencies doing around the country to support trans oriented development and affordable housing? Uh, around their stations? Yeah, it's a great question. I tell you, uh, MTR, the company in Hong Kong, uh, if, you, if you ever get a chance to study what they do in Hong Kong, how they take real estate around their mobility stations and it's owned by this private transit company and they take the revenues from the rent and subsidize the service and the service often is free or close to free. MTR is the same company that's running the Elizabeth Line in London. I got to meet with uh, the COO at the time, who's now the CEO 
of uh, UK's MTR and talk about how all that works. It was on one of my previous podcasts, if you want to hear it. But yeah, transit agencies all over the country have figured out, I mean, let's just use my example. In, in um, When I was head of the MTA, we were um, building that 16.2 mile purple line, the light rail line around, and we were working on making sure that we designated uh, the things you just talked about, all the commercially zoned property, et cetera, so that it was around the transit station, so that it made sense. Uh, and And I think Long-term public transit agencies need to have government affairs folks who are actively engaged with their general assembly and with their local government, city governments, to make sure that our perspective is represented when those decisions come up from sometimes uninformed legislators who may not fully understand the picture. Thank you so much, Paul, for uh, speaking today. Your presentation is fantastic. I learned a ton. I'm sure lots of folks here learned a ton. Um, I'm going to just wrap us up on kind of the next things for snow track that is happening so people are aware. Our next partners meeting, which is opportunity for our human service and transportation providers to come together, is happening on March 17th. Um, and our speaker series is continuing uh, for the rest of the next uh, few months um, with uh, a great panel on transit, uh, transportation demand management and CTR on April 14th. Angie Schmidt on May 3rd to talk about uh, pedestrian fatalities and the rise of them. Uh, Melissa and Chris Brentlett uh, to bring in the perspective of how to make great communities uh, centered around uh, calmer streets and better bicycling. And finally, uh, Jarrett Walker already mentioned here once or twice, uh, we'll be speaking on June 1st as the first day of Ride Transit Month hosted by Transportation Choices Coalition. Uh, so great lineup coming, and I hope you'll register for those as well. Thank you all for joining, and especially thank you to Paul Comfort for uh, the great presentation.